Well, thanks a lot for coming today. Uh, it's really exciting to get this conversation started. Uh, we look forward to many more rounds of conversation about uh, how we can approach decarbonization in Virginia. I won't spend any time talking about why. We all know why. So let's just talk about getting there. Uh, the Energy Transition Initiative, as uh, you've already heard, is a new initiative at the Weldon Cooper Center. Uh, we're hoping to uh, help uh, uh, provide a forum for conversation about decarbonization and to provide a modeling and expertise to help along the way. I want to call, call out our sponsors again. The Clean Air Task Force and S-Power have uh, been generous in their financial support for what we've done so far. And then our partners in modeling and analysis, DMME, Evolved Energy Research, and the Environmental Resilience Institute here at UVA. So let's move ahead. We already have significant policies in place for decarbonizing the electricity sector by 2050. And the next step is to move toward uh, uh, addressing the other 70% of our carbon emissions. 20, the the mid-century goal for decarbonization is starting to become a focal point for governments around the world. Uh, Japan recently announced a 2050 decarbonization goal. Uh, uh, China amazingly recently announced a 2060 decarbonization goal. For those of you who have been in this business for a while, it was unthinkable 10 years ago that that might happen. So uh, anyone who's feeling glum about the prospects of addressing climate change just has to go back and look at where we were 10 years ago compared to where we are today. Uh, Virginia is about to launch itself on a path for decarbonizing by mid-century, and we just wouldn't have expected that a very short time ago. We've, we've, uh, we have legislation that puts us on a path toward electricity sector decarbonization. Now we need to work on the other sectors as well. We have buildings, we have the industrial sector, and then the big guy, transportation. And we're already in conversations, um, for example, in the Transportation Climate Initiative on how to address transportation emissions, but um, we can't get the job done without addressing all of these sectors. So let me just run through the main conclusions that I'm going to walk us through today. First of all, we can do it. We can decarbonize the state's economy. We have run the economy through some stress tests. We've tried to limit the availability of resources to see if we could still do it even under these limited resources. And the answer is we can do it. And we can do it in a way that is affordable and is not at all disproportionate to the benefits we expect to receive in terms of our own health effects, improved economic outcomes for Virginia, and of course, our contribution to global decarbonization. Um, what's also clear is that different approaches, different policies and priorities are gonna result in a very significantly different resource mix. And that's not a surprise, but it's important to get a handle on what differences policies make so we can choose sensibly between the policy pathways. Careful planning and policy design are gonna be critical to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. This is not a trivial exercise, it is a difficult exercise but it's doable and important. Uh, good policy design, uh, a robust political conversation is important to make it, make it happen. Uh, also, it's super important that there be uh, a robust coordination between state and local governments. Local governments have a lot at stake here and they have a large role to play. And there has to be a continuing and robust conversation to make sure everyone is working together in a way that's mutually satisfactory. Uh, and finally, a quicker start means lower costs. The sooner we get started addressing economy-wide decarbonization, the cheaper it's gonna be for us to do it. Now let's just talk about why it's so important to get started now. 
this is a picture of turnover in various technologies that we uh, that are associated with carbon emissions in Virginia. And of course, if you look down here at the bottom, these two right here, uh, we expect any power plant built today to still be around at 2050. And so it's really important that we keep in mind that any fossil fuel power plants we build today, next year, the year after, are likely to still be in service at the end of this horizon. And either they're burning something else or they're going out of commission at that time. Pipelines, I think we've already got that one taken care of. I hope so. Uh, but also look at commercial boilers, look at vehicles. If we don't start addressing commercial boilers now, then in just a few years, the commercial boilers that are installed will be in service in 2050. So we need to start addressing these contributions to our emissions as quickly as we can, if we're gonna get there. All right, I uh, forgot to set my timer. Uh, I'm gonna do that now, so I don't run over too much. Okay, now let's talk about the four pillars of cost-effective decarbonization. These are not new, we didn't come up with these. These are ideas that are percolating around the country as other states and jurisdictions are thinking about decarbonizing. We, we have to address energy efficiency. Energy efficiency has some of the cheapest reductions in the short run. We can't depend on it for everything, but it's super important that we take advantage of energy efficiency gains. And in the course of electrification, we'll be getting efficiency gains as a matter of course but we're gonna to need to invest more in energy efficiency even after the gains from electrification. Another thing I wanna specifically call out is responsiveness in energy end use. In Dominion's current integrated resource plan, there are additional combustion turbines proposed to be built. And uh, I think that it's pretty clear to most observers that a modest investment in demand response in the responsiveness of end use can eliminate the needs, the need of building any additional combustion turbines. And this is uh, something we want to investigate in detail in the near future, uh, because once they're built, they'll be around for a long time. Electricity sector decarbonization, we've talked about that a fair amount. Um, there's a lot going on already in that regard. Um, and then uh, the third pillar is electrifying everything. It, uh, in order to reduce emissions from the transportation sector, we are gonna ha have to electrify it. That's our sort of one of the linchpins of decarbonization between now and 2050 is getting the transportation sector mostly electrified. And what's not electrified, we'll, much of it will be running on carbon-free fuels. Finally, the fourth pillar, some effort at decarbonization. In the end, it may not be possible to eliminate every last bit of combustion of fossil fuels in the state, at least not at any reasonable cost. If it's cheaper to pull CO2 back out of the atmosphere, we may choose at the margin to make that trade off. And we have the opportunity to do that as I'll describe in our, in our modeling effort. Okay, so uh, I just want to uh, I just want to reinforce the idea that Christina made at the beginning. These are just scenarios. They are not forecasts. We're not saying this is what's going to happen. We're saying here are some possible uh, qualitative pathways that we can investigate, and there are many others, of course, as well. But we wanted to see the range of possible outcomes. The interesting point is every one of our scenarios assumes full decarbonization. It's just how we get there that's different. Okay, oh, I just said that. All scenarios, all of, this is the common assumptions for our scenarios. All of our scenarios achieve net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, all of our scenarios include the following. All the existing laws in place, the Virginia Clean Economy Act, et cetera, membership in Reggie. Uh, uh, we assume mid-range uh, cost forecasts this is not an optimistic scenario. This is a mid-range mid um, scenario that doesn't make the most optimistic assumptions about technology or energy efficiency or anything else. Those things can only help us. 
So let's see if we can do it without being overly optimistic up front. If we can, then that's a home run. Um, we're going to impose a constraint on the amount of land that will be put uh, under utility scale solar. That's just to, um, to acknowledge the opportunity costs of uh, using land for utility scale solar. This is not a hard and fast constraint. It's just a way of showing that there are other uses for land. And as we put more land in utility scale solar, the costs of adding more and more uh, will tend to rise. And so we want to take that into account in our modeling. Uh, we provide some incentive for distributed solar development because right now, not much of it would be cho chosen by a, uh, a model that tries to minimize cost. But in the longer run, as technology improves, we expect distributed solar will make a larger contribution. And it, again, it depends on how rapidly the technology improves. Uh, we keep our existing nuclear fleet in all of our scenarios, and we're assuming that the rest of the country is decarbonizing along with us. That way, we're not getting um, a free lunch. Everybody else is not decarbonizing. We're buying all their carbon-free energy. That would make it too easy. Um, so uh, I just want to point out we are assuming quite a lot of energy efficiency in our model, improvements in building shells, um, uh, electrification of building services, um, improvements in lighting and HVAC technology. And of course, in transport, just the process of electrifying uh, transport generates a lot of improvements, uh, a lot of energy efficiency improvements all by itself. And of course, those technologies will improve over time as well. Um, one thing that might surprise people is we're assuming fairly rapid growth in data center electricity use. And the reason is, well, that's what's happening. And while data centers are getting more efficient, we're building them so fast that uh, the use of electricity in data centers is going up fairly rapidly. We want to be able to accommodate that. And I just want to point out that now that we're going to be under a cap on emissions, we should be happy that data centers are moving here because that means data centers may be moving from outside the cap into the cap and that's a net reduction in CO2 emissions because the cap will not go up when those data centers move into the Reggie region. All right. Um, so uh, just to run you through our specific scenarios really quickly, uh, net zero is our main uh, least cost scenario. We just let the model choose based on our technology forecast. Uh, how would you, uh, the model is asked to find the least cost pathway to decarbonization by 2050 based on the assumptions about technology. Constrained solar and land use and no new nuclear sort of models the case where the state and localities don't work together well. They don't plan, they don't talk, they don't work out uh, a plan for accomplishing decarbonization that's mutually satisfactory. Um, slow consumer adoption of EVs and building electrification is essentially shows us how much more expensive it is if we don't move ahead with electrification of the um, uh, uh, transportation sector and of building uh, energy services. And finally, rapid technological innovation. That's the happy scenario. Uh, if we can encourage lots of new techno technological development, we can do this cheaper, we can do it faster, we can do it better. Uh, so just to run through the key results, Solar, everybody already knows this result. Solar, offshore wind, and existing nuclear form the foundation of our energy supply in 2050. I wanna, I wanna talk about our current nuclear fleet just for a second, because what it provides for us is firm, non-emitting power. And any scenario that we can think of moving forward is gonna require some source of firm, not emitting power, base load, what we used to call base load power. And that's going to reduce the cost of any, any scenario we approach. Right now, we have these nuclear plants in place, and um, keeping them really helps keep the cost of transitioning to renewables in the rest of the energy sector much lower. Um, natural gas capacity that we have in place, we keep it around, we convert it to non-fossil uh, non carbon-free fuel. Uh, 
we expect hydrogen to play an important role. Uh, my own feeling is hydrogen is coming along much faster than we would have forecast even three or four years ago. Um, Bio-based synthetic fuels are gonna be important and some negative emissions. Uh, our model shows us using the current uh, amount of biofuels that we currently burn in Virginia and essentially using that to generate hydrogen, the most valuable service though, is the sequestration of the carbon. So just uh, to show how the resource, uh, resources match the load, um, here up here on top, we have the expected load. The dark part of the bar is our current load. This is what we expect for growth. Now, if you think electricity demand is not gonna grow that fast, all the better, but we did not want to make what we felt were too optimistic assumptions about our ability to reduce energy demand, say from um, reconfiguring building shells in the state. It's going to take us quite a while to reap, to harvest all those gains. And so uh, what we are able to show is that even with fairly rapid increase in electricity generation, uh, partly due to electrification of transportation, partly due to uh, growth and demand for other reasons, we still have the resources we need down here in the second bar uh, to accomplish that. The better we do in shaving off parts of energy demand growth, the less we need of offshore wind, floating offshore wind, uh, possibly new nuclear technology, right? It gives us more wiggle room to choose pathways. All right. Um, in, uh, in our model, um, final energy demand falls. Why? Because there's so much energy efficiency gain to be had, especially from electrification of the transportation sector. In the long run, we'll have some more energy demand growth, but by the time energy demand starts growing again after its decline, we will be, uh, it will be largely carbon-free energy sources. Um, and just to show you breaking this out by sector, we have building energy demand, industry and transportation demand. Um, we're anticipating a big reduction in fossil fuel component of transportation demand, an increase in electrification, an increase in hydrogen use for long haul trucking, for example. Uh, and then in buildings, of course, the dominant effect is from electrification. Um, now, just to talk about the kind of capacity we need, here are our four scenarios. We have net zero, constrained land and nuclear, slow consumer adoption of electrification, and then our high innovation scenario. Uh, in each of these, we have as big a solar build out as our model allows. We always hit our constraint because solar is a very cheap resource. And so our model builds out to 1% of land coverage right away, or in the case of our constrained uh, land scenario, it's 0.5% of the land area in um, utility scale solar. And the dark orange is distributed solar, essentially rooftop solar. And that only has a large impact in the case where uh, land is constrained here, or in the high innovation scenario where battery technology and rooftop generation and the soft costs of uh, rooftop solar come down fast enough to make it highly competitive with other sources. Uh, offshore wind is a big player in all of our scenarios, more in some than in others, but we're talking about a fairly substantial offshore wind build. And this is an area that we feel uh, needs a lot more investigation um, energy storage, of course, is super important. Uh, it's going to end up being even more important if we have lots of great innovation in energy storage technologies. Uh, and finally, our model chooses some nuclear build. Generally, we're assuming some reduction in costs of new nuclear technologies that will be available to build, say, in the 2040s, so we can have some new nuclear technology available by 2050. Uh, as you saw, in earlier slides, it's not an essential component of all of our scenarios. It's just uh, 
firm non-emitting power. And there may be other ways we can provide that firm non-emitting power, but it, it may be, this may be the least cost way depending on innovation in new nuclear technologies. Uh, and just a picture of our generation uh, mix here, the blue is, is offshore wind, uh, the yellow is solar generation, and uh, the gray is generation from natural gas power plants. And I'd like to show you how that works. Natural gas power plants are burning natural gas from in the early years, but less and less of it. Ultimately, we keep them around, but they're burning non-emitting fuels. They're burning zero carbon fuels. And another thing I wanna point out is uh, we, we limit imports of electricity in the way we run our model. Uh, there are more, there's more electricity available for imports. It will require substantial investment in grid, uh, grid upgrades and excess electricity available, say, from the Midwest or other sources with um, sort of higher concentration of renewable power. We didn't want to depend on imports. We wanted to see uh, what we could do with um, uh, cost-effective energy generation within Virginia. That turns out to have some economic benefits for the state. Uh, I'm gonna, not going to dwell on hydrogen too much. Much of it is used in our transportation sector um, in the scenarios we have, rather than as a long-term storage technology, much of it is for transportation. Um, uh, I do want to point out that uh, all of our scenarios have some zero carbon fuel in them, uh, I want to especially point out uh, biomass, synthetic natural gas, and uh, power to liquid fuels, so uh, you know, non-emitting liquid fuels, um, and um, those have different contributions depending on the other constraints we place in the model. Okay, uh, just want to make sure, okay, a little more time. Um, all right, just trying to get my clock back. Oh, I've got to hurry up. Okay, so uh, now I just want to talk about uh, why this might be beneficial to Virginia. I'm almost done here. First of all, I want to point out that in the course of doing this, there are some significant sort of surprising economic benefits. We're starting to build, we're starting to generate our own electricity rather than importing it from other states. Much of this clean electricity, these clean renewable resources are generated in Virginia. Why are we doing that now when we weren't doing it before? Because technology has made it possible for us to generate our own energy in a cost-effective way rather than import fuels from other states. And that's economic good news for Virginia. So just, just to run through the, the key lessons quickly, timely adoption of new technology is important. Uh, constraints on solar and new nuclear may be quite expensive. Um, innovation is super important. The more we can do to support and encourage innovation, the better. Um, coordination between state and local governments is critical. Um, we can do without and should do without building any more fossil fueled uh, power plants. And we should keep around what we have, but um, convert it over to non-fossil energy. Um, I have in the slides, um, sort of uh, the, the task we need to undertake in the short run to make this happen. And uh, I won't dwell on this because I'm running out of time, but the, the point of this slide is that we actually need to start now. We need to start the transition now if we're going to be in, play, in a position in the 30s to really ramp the transition up, ramp the, de the electrification of transportation up ramp up the electrification of the building sector, the, uh, the, the improvements in efficiency of building shells, et cetera. And then finally in the 2040s, building substantial new technologies of one sort or another. All right, so I'm gonna skip this slide and make some general comments about um, economic benefits to the state. Um, and I just, uh, what I'd like to do now is just talk about um, why we've chosen the particular breakout groups we've chosen for today. Uh, our interest in getting this modeling done right now is about getting the conversation started about policy changes we need to make in the short run if we're going to have a cost-effective pathway for 
full decarbonization by 2050. We want to encourage the policy conversation to get started now because the sooner we get started, the cheaper it is. And if we wait too long on some of these areas, it gets much harder and much more expensive and ultimately not even possible to achieve full decarbonization. So waiting is costly. So we want to definitely start thinking about transportation. We need to start thinking about electrification of the building stock and improved energy efficiency. And so uh, there are policies we can st start thinking about today that can help us take advantage of um, today's opportunities for enhancing the energy performance of the building stock. Um, grid transformation and distributed resources. Uh, the grid takes time to change. Uh, we have had uh, decades to build a centralized grid for distributing electricity from central station power plants. We need to start thinking right away about changing the way our grid works, about two-way um, transfer of electricity uh, in between um, users and generators across the state. And finally, utility scale solar. Uh, one of the linchpins of getting to decarbonization under any scenario. We need to think about what are the constraints? What are the frictions? There's my timer. What are the frictions? And, um, and then um, what um, institutions do we have to put in place if we're going to get the greatest gain from our utility scale solar resources? All right. Thank you very much. I really um, appreciate the fact you've taken the time to join us today, and I hope for a really robust conversation about um, things we can start doing to help us achieve the goal of decarbonization. Super. Thanks a lot.